My name is Karen Tucker. I'm CEO at the Churchill Club, and it's wonderful to see you. We really appreciate you coming out and joining us this morning. This Churchill Club program is called What is Our Digital Destiny? It's predicated on the idea that inevitably digitization will branch far beyond what we see today with massive implications for innovation, for economic growth, and for people. So we are privileged to have three big thinkers with us this morning to tackle the topic. In the middle, we have Sean Duberbach, Chief Economist and Senior Director of Research for the Consumer Electronics Association. And Sean is also the author of the acclaimed new book called Digital Destiny, How the New Age of Data Will Change the Way We Live, Work, and Communicate. Next, to my left here, we have Larry Downs, consultant and co-author of the recent book, Big Bang Disruption, Strategy in the Age of Devastating Innovation. And finally, Robin Murdoch, managing director within the Media Communications and High Technology Group at Accenture and longtime content advisor to the Churchill Club. Welcome and thank you very much for being with us this morning. For hosting us in this wonderful facility, let's thank Accenture. A few words about this organization, the Churchill Club. Our mission is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. In our, we are now in our 30th year of presenting up to 40 programs each year where like minds can connect with one another and new ideas. We uh, respectfully and routinely ask our speakers not to pitch, but rather to contribute new thinking and ideas to advance collective thinking and hopefully move the needle around innovation and economic growth. So where do they see the new opportunities? We hope that you will get a lot out of the time that you spend here this morning and that you will participate in the audience Q&A. If our speakers don't happen to cover a topic of interest to you, raise your hand, ask for the microphone, and ask your question. Churchill Club is a member-supported, nonprofit organization, and if you like what you experience here this morning, we do hope that you will consider joining and supporting us. If you are tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club, and there are other Twitter codes in your printed programs. Our next program is next week on January 22nd, called Trends in Journalism, When Critics Become Capitalists, with speakers Corey Johnson of Bloomberg, Sarah Lacey of Pando Daily, and Josh Quitner of Flipboard. And then on January 28th, we look at data privacy on Data Privacy Day 2015 in collaboration with the NCSA. Uh, just coming off of the worst year on record for data breaches and a number of other uh, important trends, that will be a very rich discussion. So we hope you'll join us for one or both of those programs. Let's now go to Sean Dubravac, who will kick off our discussion. Sean. Thank you, Karen. Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Sean Duberbeck. I'm the chief economist for the Consumer Electronics Association, probably best known as the producers of a small little trade show in Las Vegas <laughs> called the International CS. Uh, we're just off our biggest year, almost 50 years of history, 1 point, uh, sorry, 2.2 million square feet, 170,000 of your nearest and dearest friends. So I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, that today. And this is my Oprah moment. We've given you all a copy of uh, my news book, which just published yesterday, Digital Destiny, which looks at the history of how we ended up here, but also paints a picture of what the implications are when everything becomes digital, becomes connected, becomes sensorized. And we see a world where that really starts to impact every experience that we have, and we'll, uh, we'll get into that as well. Larry, let me turn it now to you, and um, perhaps you can spend a minute and just introduce yourself and Robin as well. Um, sure. Uh, well, thank you, and, and uh, th thank you to the Church of Club Accenture, and congratulations on your book. I had the privilege of, of reading it in manuscript, so I can I can say with, with complete confidence it's going to be a terrific success. Um, and it, I think it encapsulates a lot of the, uh, of the same kinds of technologies that, uh, that I've been looking at in, in the research I've been doing with the Accenture Institute for High Performance, and that was the, the basis of, of our book last year, Big Bang Disruption. Uh, and it's just more of the same. Uh, I, think, I think, you know, 
we, we certainly talk about CES this year since the two of us were there. Uh, my feet still hurt. Um, but I think um, one of the big themes I want to look at is what, what we think of as the sort of the, the second generation of disruptive innovation as a result of the digital revolution. So uh, 20 years ago, uh, when I first started writing about these trends, you know, the, the industries that were really affected immediately were the obvious ones, uh, consumer electronics, computing, communications, uh, entertainment, and media, the ones that were effectively uh, using those technologies all along as kind of the core of their offering. What we found in the research for Big Bang Disruption was that now we're entering a new stage where uh, all the other industries that weren't affected or weren't as uh, transformed the first time around, now it's their turn. Uh, and a lot of you know, interesting reasons we could talk about why some industries happening slower than others, some happening faster than others, but uh, all the same kinds of you know, being Amazon, being Napsterized, being all the sort of same things that happened the first time around are now starting to happen in industries that had very little impact uh, last time. And that's created a, both uh, you know, an interesting set of threats and an interesting threat set of opportunities for incumbent businesses as well as startups, investors, uh, and uh, and you know other interested parties. So um, those are the technologies I think that you that you write about so well in, in the book. And you know we should sort of you know hopefully talk about some of, as many of them as we can. Yeah, Robin. Yeah, fantastic, Robin Murdoch uh, from Accenture. I lead our um, global industry that serves um, our internet and social clients um, around the world. Um, I've been with Accenture for nearly two decades and. One of, the, one of the privileges of working at Accenture is I get to work with um, lots of exciting clients. And um, actually kind of in my, as I chart sort of my, my history with Accenture, I've, I've been working around digital disruption for really the last couple of decades. And it's interesting you mentioned Napster. I was working with the music majors, in fact, all of them, uh, when Napster hit them and uh, you know, their response or lack thereof. Um, and then, then I did a lot of. I've done a lot of work in the um, console gaming space. I've worked on all, all of the last three generations of uh, the consoles we we know and love today. And those are kind of interesting from a digital disruption perspective because, unlike the smartphone that we throw away every every couple of years, consoles, uh, you know, the likes of PlayStation and Xbox, they have to last for a much longer period of time. So the product strategy and the digital decisions that you're going to make around um, uh, architecting those consoles and uh, and how you launch them and how how they work through their generations is very different from a lot of the throwaway consumer electronics uh, we see today. I've also been lucky enough to since sort of 2005 um, work with the leading cloud providers on architecting their global clouds, um, and that's interesting because from a capital intensity perspective, you're making decisions that are quite often you know, a decade, or indeed if you're looking at stuff like network technology and laying fiber across oceans, that's a two decade investment. So you're kind of looking, peering into the digital future and trying to guess, guess where the world's heading. And then as you look at sort of some of the other areas I've worked in around mobile and <coughs> IoT, a much, much more fast cycle development. And in fact, if you look at you know, the results from CES, just amazing development just over the past year around the Internet of Things. Um, I, and just bringing it full circle, I started my career with uh, Ford Motor Company uh, back in Europe in vehicle development, particularly around electronics. And I, I worked in the uh, Worked with Ford back in like '95 with virtual reality using silicon graphics and a thing called a cyber glove that you would put on and you could see your hand. And um, 20 years on, it, it actually works. <laughs> back in the day, 20 years ago, it didn't, and we couldn't achieve what we wanted to. So I think I think it's interesting as we look at digital disruption and we look at kind of the fast pace that we see that everything is changing really, really fast, that there are these long cycle developments around digital technology that actually underpin a lot of the change we see and the disruption we see right now. Although we look at disruption and say it's happening right now, a lot of the seeds and foundations that allow that disruption to occur are actually sowed over a decade or so. So I'm <laughs> delighted to be, be with both of you, and congratulations on the book, Sean. Uh, I've, I've skimmed it. I've only had a day to, to read it, and a fascinating read. Well, thank you, Robin. So it's interesting we both, uh, or all three of us really, but both of you have talked about timing, and it's something I talk about in the 
in the book as well. Um, we tend to think of these eureka moments, right? These aha moments where, where innovation is binary, but really it's, it's part of this broader evolutionary path that plays out over years or decades. Uh, I think that's definitely what we see with the trends that we're talking about today, digitization, connection, sensorization. We started first with devices that were owned at very high frequencies. Televisions were one of the first to really become digitized. 98% of households have them, they own three of them. So you, you take something that's widely owned and you start there. So we've now gone through, over the last 15 years, all of the core devices that we have. And we're starting to now spill over into these adjacent spaces, these second order effects, I suppose, if you will. Uh, what do those start to look like? What's, you know, we, we can kind of, paint to the end of the story where everything gets impacted. That's an easy jump. What's the sequence of events do we see from now until the, the end of digitization, if you will? And yeah, well, as, you know, as, a, as sort of a general rule, one of the things that, that we have found in our, our research about industry transformation is um, it sort of happens, there, there's a famous quote from Ernest Hemingway, a, a character asks another character, how did you go bankrupt? And the other one says, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. Um, and that's exactly what we found uh, in the industries that we looked at, is you see a long period of gradual change where the incumbents say, all right, you know, this new technology is coming, it may eventually affect our core customers or our core products, but it's happening in sort of an incremental way, almost a predictable way, and, uh, and we don't really have to worry about it. And then one day, um, some event happens or some critical mass is reached, some product, you know, somebody finally gets the right combination of, of technologies and a business model and they put it together and they let it go and it's Facebook. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, all the rules are, are changed. Uh, and I think that's sort of, you know, the, the, the general trend we're seeing. So as you, as you talk about in the book, the, 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 co the sort of price performance and size and power utilization, also very important, of sensor technologies of kind of, you know, of, you know computing stuff uh, is getting better all the time and you keep kind of having this Moore's Law type effect. So it now becomes cost effective to start introducing intelligence into more and more things. And, and my takeaway, I think, from, from Las Vegas last week, uh, I, I said in, in, a, in an article that, uh, that we did for Forbes, was um, if there was a sort of one overriding message, it was, it was kind of the theme song from the Lego movie. Uh, instead of everything is awesome, it would be everything is connected. Everything you saw was connected to everything else. And, and one of the ones that really struck me was the Nest uh, Smart Thermostat. They now have a partner program called uh, Works with Nest. And, 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 and the list of partners initially seemed completely bizarre. You know, it, was the, it was the car companies, uh, it was, it was um, uh, the lock company, uh, it was, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the, the, uh, uh, the other, oh, your Fitbit, you know, the, 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 uh, the, like, what do those have to do with the thermostat? Well, the, oh, and the dryer, that was a Whirlpool, also is part of it. So your dryer is now talking to your thermostat. Well, what, what's going on? Well, what it's telling you is, if you, let's say, you get in the car uh, and you left, okay, well, if the car tells that to the thermostat, the thermostat says, oh, all right, there's nobody home. So we're gonna turn down the heat or turn off the air conditioning. And if you're, and if you're not home, then the dryer can be told, hey, they're not coming back, so slow down the cycle or, you know, in 10 minutes before they arrive, Arrive, uh, turn it back on to get a sort of a fresh cycle. Or when you put your key in the smart lock, it says, "Oh, uh, Sean just walked in the house. This is the temperature he likes." So you know, adjust the settings accordingly. And these are kind of connections that, as I say, initially they seem quite bizarre. But as you kind of work your way through it, you realize, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And of course, these are totally different industries. You know, the, the car companies and the washing machine companies and the thermostat companies and Google, all these, they don't normally think, seem like th people who would be partners or things that would go together. But once you get to that, that incredibly low price point and you just shove a sensor, dozens of sensors into everything, then suddenly these connections become possible and the idea of industry, what, you know, this is the car industry, this is the manufacturing industry, this is the, the very idea of industry starts to, to starts to fall away and you see these, these very strange bedfellows. Yeah, and I think one of the things that happens in technology is we, we have these periods where we move from a scarcity, hmm. we take a resource and it goes from a scarcity to a surplus. So I always think about the 60s and 70s where computing power was a, a scarcity 
And so we used it very sparingly. Universities may or may not have had computer access. You know, there might have been a mainframe that people could queue up for. They would sign up for time on the computer. And then uh, around 84, we take that scarce resource and it kind of becomes an abundance. And so we start to waste it. Uh, 1984, Apple, of course, introduces the Macintosh, the first computer to use a graphical user interface. Prior to that time, we would have never wasted computing power on rendering a graphical user interface because it was a re essentially a redundant feature. If you wanted to control the computer, you would use a command window. Xerox had tried a graphical user interface in 81, but it hadn't been successful. Uh, and it was very expensive because you were having to pay a premium for that computing power. And so it tends to switch. I feel like sensors are there today yeah. where it's gone from a scarcity to a surplus, so we start to waste it. And when we do, it, it creates these new opportunities or these new marketplaces. So I think about image sensors on phones. We used to only include one image sensor on the back so you could take pictures. Then we started to include a second image sensor on the front. Now we're including multiple ones, but start to include a second one on the front. And, and what happens, right? It changes our behavior. It introduces the selfie. Yep. And then we can argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's the word of the year <laughs> two years ago, not, not the right. last and, year. Yeah. And that's empowered because we deployed sensors on the front of that mobile device. And so I think if you're in an industry, you need to think about what are the deployment of sensors going to do to the experience that yeah. my end user has. And that's a great example of the gradual and then suddenly phenomenon. So one of the things that's driving the, the, the sensorization of everything is uh, sort of an unexpected uh, event, which was the smartphone revolution. So we now have billion plus smartphone devices. And what that's done is it's created this secondary market for all the parts that go into smartphones. So if, right. I, if you take a, a commercial drone, if you take a 3D printer, if you take most of the things in the internet, things, if you literally take them apart, what you find is that most, uh, most of the pieces in them are smartphone pieces. Uh, often the last generation smartphone pieces, you now buy them cheap on the secondary market because they've been made in such incredible volume right. that you say, oh, okay, I get a gyroscope, an accelerometer, a magnetometer, the cameras, the displays, the chipsets themselves, uh, they're being made in such incredible volume just for the smartphone market that it spills over into these other industries and suddenly what might have been years away from being a, a cost effective moment in which to start introducing these technologies, oops, now it's happening overnight. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I'd say I'd say, you know, as you look at as you look at the core technologies, you know, I like to think of it in simplistic terms as you know, at the device level, huge advances, as, as, as both of you rightly say, at the sensor level. You've then got the network, you know, the connectivity. You talked about these connected devices. Um, arguably, connectivity, certainly at last mile, is not moving as fast as, um, uh, as we're seeing the devices, uh, the advances in devices. And then you've got the cloud that is just, you know, unlocking um, incredible creativity. But I'm struck by, you know, at a technology level, there are those things happening, but there are three other things that I think are almost as vital. And I think the reason we're seeing the explosion um, of creativity and everything you're seeing at CES is not only the technology development, but also the fact that there are kind of open ecosystems for development. So if you're a small startup today, um, you can now conceivably go into the hardware space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can work with a variety of different players in the supply chain. You know, from Shenzhen through to you know using Amazon, Shipwire, etc., to to do your fulfillment. Uh, you can actually get into the hardware space, and clearly in the software space, you know, we've seen many years of open source now. So you know, you can stand on the shoulders of giants. The other thing, of course, and you mentioned smartphones, you know, you can look at the smartphone or you can look at actually the user and the, the financial power of that user. Um, you know, with Android and iOS, just take those two, um, that's two, that's one billion uh, customer accounts, one billion paying users that you as an individual developer, if you're willing to sign up and develop for, for Android or iOS, you can access. Well, that's that's unique. That's something that's happened over the last uh, last few years. And then, and then, sort of back to back to your world, Sean. Um, you know, just a continual rise in consumer electronics spend, and indeed enterprises spend on consumer electronics. And what's fascinating, just in, in that space, is not only are we spending more and more on consumer electronics as the, uh, at the expense of other categories. Um, 
products like you know your TV is costing less. Certain categories are going obsolete, so you kind of get a headroom opening up, and so that that kind of fueling of of spend in these new categories is just is just phenomenal. And it kind of comes to the point of you know how many units of the Apple Watch will be sold, and there isn't you know what's your proxy for 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 how many Apple Watches will be sold? Well, there's such a huge amount of spend that's opening up for for these devices. So I fully agree. I think we're in a we're in an amazing time of creativity in the digital space. And it's almost this, this Cambrian moment where, where we're just seeing the proliferation of, of so, many, so many different products as evidenced by CES. The interesting thing will be which ones of those will survive, which ecosystems will survive. Um, and to your point, um, Larry, about uh, you know, how will they interact? It's a very good question. You know, that which 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 services will will be the kingmakers and the platforms that everything will congregate to? Will it be iOS? Will it be Android? Will it be you know some some new company we we haven't thought of? So I think um, you know, absolutely fascinating time and an incredible amount of change we'll see over the next few years. Well, and the standards too. I mean, a big part of it, and we've been seeing this now in the Internet of Things for the last several years, is there is not yet a, a kind of uh, dominant standard for how these devices will will share data and interact. Um, there are three, four, maybe five competing uh, ones. We don't, you know, I, I wouldn't predict which one is going to win. But we also found in, in in the research that it's very typical in a sort of an emerging new ecosystem that you will see. In fact, it's a sign of maturity when you see a fight among different possible standards uh, providers. Uh, and eventually, as I say, it gets worked out. But until it gets worked out, it, it's, it's, it's very chaotic. And right now, most of the, the Internet of Things uh, solutions, and there were many, many more of them this year yeah. than last year, but most of them are kind of point solutions. It's like, OK, this is the, this is the smart baby monitor. This is the smart uh, electric grill. Uh, this is the smart, uh, what was my favorite? Oh, the smart yoga mat. That was, that was a good one this year. Um, they're really aimed at a particular solution for a particular audience. Uh, they're not really part of some whole, but you can see, you know, it's kind of groping towards that. And we know it, it will happen, but as you say, uh, we don't know who is going to is going to make the the, the market. Well, and I think what we're doing is we're building out the nodes, right? So yeah. you're building out the nodes of the network, and the nodes of the network five years ago were a couple of core devices primarily PCs, mobile phones started to show up, tablets, but we've, we've changed the structure of the network, making the mobile phone right now the, the center of this, of this network. And so it becomes this hub device for all of these devices. And if you look at many of those devices that are launching, that are connecting to the internet, uh, they, they don't have an interface, yeah. right? They, the interface is the smartphone. That's the viewfinder into this digital life. I look back 15 years ago, and the, our, our digital existence was very separate from our analog existence. We kind of kept those two worlds separate. And we would actually go online. You know, we, we even talked about going online or logging online. Uh, and we viewed those as very distinct identities. And we see that blurring with that mobile phone really becoming the bridge that allows us to easily toggle between those two identities, which were once very distinct and now are quickly merging. I look at younger cohorts. And which may not necessarily be such a good thing. Yeah, well, and I think, I mean, I think that's an interesting premise that social norms will start to set in and will start to apply social norms to what we want to have digitized and what we don't want to have digitized. So the, the question now is not, can we digitize it? It's not a technical question anymore. And that used to be the focus was, you know, the, the technical solutions. Now it's, yeah. should we digitize it? And if so, how do we connect it? Do we connect it directly over, over a 4G or 3G or 2G network? Do we use Bluetooth? Do we use, you know, some other type of communication protocol? And ultimately, what's the use case scenario? And I think that becomes the, the paramount question is, what does that use case scenario look like for my, ex for my experience? Yeah. And you know one of the sort of you know, so so one of the positive side effects of all this entrepreneurship and innovation is you do get uh, kind of a thousand flowers blooming and people experimenting and, and as yeah. Robin says it's it's so easy now you can you source the parts over the cloud you can build stuff over that I mean you can everything can be done uh, so in a, such a virtual way that you can really be in the hardware business even if you're one person and we found some great examples of a couple of art teachers making products uh, just just for fun. Uh, the risk, though, is uh, because there is no head to this monster, 
is, uh, is I think, one of the, the big problems we're already seeing is, is concern about privacy and security, yeah. um, which is no surprise. So, you know, a lot of the folks who are going into the business of Internet of Things, of you know, sort of smart devices, uh, don't have a lot of history. They may have no history. They may, they may literally be startups. So they don't understand concepts like privacy by design. Uh, they don't think about encryption. They don't really think about kind of, well, what's the risk case here? And, and, and not so much even the damage, but the, the bad people PR that it causes for everybody when somebody hacks the baby, the smart baby monitor, and starts you know talking to somebody else's kid, um, which is you know is, is so creepy that that people start to step back and say, oh well maybe there should be some you know sort of central authority here defining the standards before we go too much further. It's clearly not the way things happen in the United States, so it doesn't matter if that's what that's what you want or not. But uh, it is one of I think one of one of the one of the downsides to our open-ended kind of permissionless innovation a culture. It's interesting, you know, you, you, you mentioned sort of the, the data sets that are being built and whether it's controlled. Um, one of the things that sort of we're seeing is that um, there's all this siloed data being uh, being built up by multiple different players that, that isn't talking to each other. And in fact, as a, as a little exercise over the last few months, I, um, I, I extracted all the data I could from every single digital service that I use. So I wanted to see who had what on me. And I went to Google, to Facebook, to, you know, to Fitbit, to, to all of these sources and pulled the data and the reality is what you realize when you do that is, well, one, there's an unparalleled amount of information yeah. being captured. Um, you know, for instance, I learned from Google that my average altitude last year was 602 feet. <laughs> so how does Google know my average altitude? Well, that's, that's quite, it's quite, quite a factoid that they don't, they don't necessarily publish. But, um, but I'm just struck by kind of the silo data and, and I suppose what I'm intrigued by is you can look at that as you know all of the all of the uh, <clears throat> security threats, the trust the trust issues, the privacy. You know, okay, put that to one side. What's the opportunity of that data being connected? Um, and where's where is that going to lead? And how will that data be brought together? I think a really nice example of that is. Um, is in our personal memory space, so in in uh, our photos and our videos. And if if any of you are like me, you know you've got your photos stored in a variety of different places and video. You've got your fitness data and other data sets. Think about that narrative if it was brought together about telling a story about you know, what you did last year, um, where you were. I know some of it's shown on Facebook, and indeed Facebook's doing some interesting things with with their um, you know year in review. But um, I'm just fascinated by how does that data set get harnessed in the future? How does it all get combined? And how does it draw insights and improve our life, entertain us, inform us, and indeed maybe in the business, well certainly in the business world, you know, improve business outcomes? I think we're in this interesting period of time where things aren't really talking to each other. We're all using, we're all creating this proliferation of data but it's yet to really be harnessed. And I think one of the brilliant things, though, is it's all sitting in the cloud. So when technology finally catches up, my 40,000 photos that sit on iCloud or, or in, in Google, you know, interesting things will happen with those in the future. Uh, when I think it's when we start to move to predict, predictive recommendation <laughs> engines. So right now we do a great job of looking in the past. Here's all your photos. Here's the number of steps you took. Here's the movies that you've watched. But we don't do a great job of, of predicting a recommendation, especially when it deviates from the historical course. So there's no reason today that some of these fitness devices, wearable devices, couldn't also look at my calendar, which is digital, and say, hey, you're not going to hit your goals today unless you deviate from your course. Uh, looking at the photos, you could easily imagine uh, vacation recommendation engines that look at where you've been and suggest places you haven't been or suggest, hey, we see that you've done a lot of beach photos, those are some of your favorite photos, and it, and it really then connects with this I don't know, inner enjoyment that we have that we didn't maybe fully recognize. Yeah, I thought I liked the beach. I didn't realize quite how much I liked the beach. And these vacation recommendation engines are now saying I should check out these beaches because of the photos that they've been able to cull through. So I think one of the big struggles for companies today is figuring out how much do I tell the customer about themselves. They know a tremendous amount, and they're hesitant to be too uh, you know, too over the top with how much they can tell them. So they don't bother to tell you what your average altitude is because they don't want 
necessarily to, to freak you out. But uh, when that becomes a useful data source, a data, a data byte, to inform and to predict something that you might be interested in, then I think that's where you start to, to really see it. Yeah, oh, and how you, how you drive usefulness out of it. I mean, um, I have, I've been using the, <clears throat> the Tile app, um, the, the, the little Tile which you attach to your keys, and, um, and uh, you know, it's tracking my location, and you know, am I fully aware that this small startup is, has all this location data of me. Well, I am, but it's also the reason that when I was at a concert and I parked my car in a place I completely forgot, it was able to guide me in the rain in the dark back to where my car was. And so I'm happy to have that trade-off um, of them knowing my location when events like that happen that are you know, remarkable when they occur. So you're, to you're both talking about kind of the, this use of the big data for sort of personal uh, uh, enlightenment, but then of course there's also the collective enlightenment. So I was just uh, hearing a story, in fact, on the radio this morning about the genetic testing service 23andMe, and this is where you take a swab of your saliva and then they, they don't decode the whole thing, but they decode some interesting parts of your, of your DNA, and they've already, you know, in a very short time, built up a pretty substantial database of individual uh, DNA samples. They're now, with the permission of, of their members, they've just sort of sent a data set of 5,000 sets of this information to Pfizer to use in research on you know, future lupus treatments and lupus drugs. And so, you, you know, in some ways, putting all the information about you is very valuable. It's even more information you put all the information or some subset of the information about a lot of people, uh, abstract it, and then you know, use that for something uh, completely different than what it may have originally been collected for. Of course, again, as soon as you start talking about either of those uses, what I sometimes refer to as the creepy factor kicks it is what, you know, 23andMe is sending data to the drug companies. That sounds awful. And then you think, well, okay, but one, they had permission. Two, it's for, you know, research. Three, it may improve health outcomes. So you, you, you have to start making these trade-offs, as you were saying, uh, and sometimes they're implicit and sometimes they're explicit, but uh, we're going to have to make a lot more of them as, 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 this data, as, as these data sets start to become connected or connectable. Yeah. And, and we see these possibilities and we realize, okay, the good news is X, the bad news is Y. Where do we where do we come? It's interesting out? though. It's kind of an incremental set of set of jumps around our personal data. One of the one of the things that I, I just find amazing over the over the last couple of years, three years or so, um, we all, there's been lots of talk about when we were going to use the cloud as our golden copy for our data, and um, you know it's been talked in you know the the, the internet space, the technology space for for years. Um, if any of you bought a new iPhone, and you, when you bought your new iPhone and you had your old iPhone, and you, um, you wiped your old iPhone, and then you connected your new iPhone to iCloud and all your photos got, got downloaded to your phone, most people did that. Most people didn't do it through, through iTunes. Well, in that one case, all of your personal data went, went, was in the cloud, and your golden copy was in the cloud, and your phone became secondary to your golden copy that was sitting in the cloud. And I think, I think that's happened, and you know, that, that flip from stuff being stored locally and all of your personal memories being stored locally to now the golden copy being in the cloud is something that's happened to us, and most people don't really realize that that massive shift occurred. But I think there are these incremental jumps that are happening, and uh, and and you know I think back to one of the earlier comments. Each one of those might not seem that big, but my God, it, it takes you so far. There was a um, one in the Golden Globes. Um, Richard Linklater won for Boyhood, this amazing film where he shot you know they shot it three days every year for the last 12 years. And uh, one of the things he did, it's a great interview with The Economist with Richard Linklater, and he made sure that in every, um, every shot they did, every, every shoot they did each year, they included some technology of the day in the shot so you could see the advance that had occurred because he was insightful enough to really understand that you know, 
of all the things that were going to change over the 12 years of filming that film, one of the things that would really impress upon people was the change in technology. And, uh, and indeed, that's what you see over 12 years. The technology that was being used in each one of those years of the movie w w was remarkable. And so I think, I think it's that, you know, those incremental the, jumps. The phones get smaller and smaller, <laughs> then they start getting bigger, <laughs> bigger and bigger, bigger, smaller and smaller, <laughs> bigger and bigger. But it's also fascinating how our preferences will change in a very, very short space of time. And you, you know, you'll know this, Sean, much more qualified to talk about this than than I am. But you know, just the cha that change in smartphones. We went from all having small smartphones and thinking that was the that was the norm to within two years, small smartphones feel weird. If you own an iPhone six plus and you're holding the iPhone five, you just think this is a it's a toy device. Um, and so I think change can happen, behavioral change can happen very fast. That's why I'm quite bullish on the Apple Watch and wearables generally, because I think, you know, I think we'll all, we'll all shift to it fairly rapidly. Well, sure. and I think that's the experiment that's taking place now. So again, it's no longer this technological question about if, but it's a, is it technologically meaningful? And so when I look at something like the Apple Watch or really any quote unquote smartwatch, this, what we're looking at is, does the internet make sense on the wrist? And if so, what are the use case scenarios? So obviously one of the use case scenarios that Apple's painting is payments. Payments make a lot of sense on the wrist, and so we're gonna empower payments on the wrist. But if at the fundamental level, that's the question we're asking everywhere. Does the internet make sense in a yoga mat? Does the internet make sense in your vehicle? Does the internet make sense here? Does it make sense there? So that's the question I think we're gonna be asking for the next three to five years. And then you start to say, does data elsewhere make the, the internet in that yoga mat a better experience? And, and then you start to tie those data streams together. So if I can take some information here and influence this decision over here or this experience, and that to me is the ultimate test for all of these things. Something happens in the physical world, we digitize it, we connect it, we sensorize it, and, and that's kind of the easy part now. The real question is do we close that feedback loop and do we get something to then change back in the physical world in this analog state? So if it's a you know if it's a fitness device, now I've digitized the level of fitness, the level of activity, the steps, does it cause me to eat differently, to sleep differently, to do different things, to change my behavior? Because if it doesn't, that's where things really start to unwind. And I think that's some of what will start to set in. Where we go, you know, the use case scenario there isn't that rich, and so I'm going to keep my analog whatever, you know, my analog yoga mat, because knowing that I have payments on my wrist didn't really influence it, or whatever it is. Sure, so sure, we'll, sure, we'll sure, sure, that so, so it's interesting, but with technology prices collapsing so fast, do you actually even need to make the decision about whether you digitize or not? I mean, is it really a question of everything's going to be digital, and it's just a question of whether it's on or off? I, well, I think like the yoga mat example, like, you know, are we going to get to the point where these sensors, I mean, we're already getting to that point, where they're so inexpensive, um, you know, maybe they can draw power from you know, your motion. You, it's just going to be implicit in, in most products over a certain value. So I think yes, but I think the, big, the bigger question is, does it provide a meaningful experience for the end user? So if it doesn't really provide a meaningful use case scenario, then it really doesn't matter whether it's digital, connected, sensorized, because it doesn't really change what's happening. And, and so I think you already see that in some states of the world. And, and you know, if you look at the way we greet each other, I mean, we, we still do that in a very analog way because it's a very efficient way. And digitization hasn't really impacted that yet. You know, and so just because digital can be doesn't mean it will be. But the but the look the sec I, to me the secondary effects uh, can be and often are even more dramatic and more important from an economic standpoint than the questions you're asking here is like you know, okay is, is this valuable for me but even more importantly as you, know, you look at the whole range now of health and fitness related IoT devices and all the different types of biometrics that are being tracked and you start to kind of again imagine a world as you do in your book if you put all those things together and you start to collect that information in some standard way. Okay, it, it tells you a bunch of stuff about yourself and changes your behavior and, and your nutrition and your exercise and so on. I'm not even as interested in that. I'm more interested in what effect does that have on the healthcare industry? 
So yeah. we, you know, we have, we have you know, uh, in, in sort of Western Civ, we have 100 plus years of a model where uh, there's sort of a professional class of doctors and healthcare professionals, and they're the only ones who had that secret information and the ability to tell you your pulse and your blood pressure and your glucose level and your oxygen right. level. And, and that, in some ways, is how the healthcare industry, for better and often for worse, has been structured. Well, now suddenly, as an as a, as a, a accidental consequence of all this cheap technology, you can imagine pretty soon a world in which every patient has that information about themselves. And they're collecting it, they're analyzing it, they're getting feedback, they're changing their behavior as a result of that. How does that affect the healthcare industry and its model of both delivery and training of professionals and so on? Those are, the, I think, those, those are sort of what I think of as those second order effects from an industry standpoint that can be much more devastating and largely because they were unintended or un, unplanned, uh, the ones that can really catch the, the incumbents uh, by surprise uh, in, in a sort of an exciting way, depending on which side of the equation you're looking at. And if nothing else, it changes the dialogue. At, a, at the very minimum, it changes the dialogue that we have with these professional services. And ultimately, I think it changes the experience that we have. So we already see that taking place. If you look at the digitization of entertainment, you know, one thing that the digitization of music did was it allowed us to break apart the album easily. And so you saw the explosion of single track experiences. And that continued on with streaming services and other elements. And so that entire music experience is, is fundamentally different than it was prior to digitization. And you can kind and now of, it's happening with video, right? It's happening with video, and it's happening. It's happened with books, and you even see the the breakdown in books where Amazon has Kindle Singles, so it's something that fits into a, a smaller space. When I look at the digitization, this connection, sensorization, and other spaces, it has the ability to really influence the experience we have. So we we talk about autonomous vehicles at CES. When your vehicle is autonomous, you don't need a steering wheel, you don't need seats that face forward, you can do anything you want in that vehicle. You could put beds, you could put couches, you could put a hot tub, you could do, it's a fundamentally different experience because of those building blocks. And so you can change everything. And I think if you're in an experience industry, you need to think about how that experience changes once it becomes connected and digitized and sensorized. Especially when it's coming from left field, when it's coming from, you know, people like Google or the smartphone manufacturers or all these other devices that have no intention of disrupting you. You're just their collateral damage. Larry, I have to ask, you know, you, you're obviously more connected with, um, with Washington, but regulation, I mean, you mentioned, we mentioned health, you mentioned driving, we've, you know, uh, mentioning drones. Um, as you look at all of those, regulation plays a massive part in the ability for businesses, maybe not consumers, but for businesses to be able to do some of the, yeah. some of the um, you know, novel use cases. Um, how do you see that playing out? Well, and this is all, and it's also a big part of, of Sean's yeah. work as well. But um, I think that was when I mentioned before that some industries are affected in a different pace than others. One of the big determinants of how fast digitization and other technologies transforms an industry is the degree to which it's already protected in some ways. Uh, it's it's a, you know its existing business model. Healthcare is a good example. Is in some ways protected from transformation by uh, a, you know vast. Uh, regulatory space. So, uh, in some ways, you know, you kind of com they complain about it, but now it becomes, in some ways, their protection from change and a weapon. So you see this, of course, very publicly in how uh, the taxi cab uh, companies are responding to things like Uber, or how the hotel industry is responding to things like Airbnb, where they say, "Listen, we have to live in this highly regulated world." And by the way, it may not make any sense anymore. Or much of it may not make any sense anymore. Or we could do it a lot differently. But that's not the conversation we want to have. The conversation you have is you got to stop these guys from working because they don't have to play by those rules. They can deliver these things uh, at a lower cost because they don't have the, the cost of regulation. And, 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 and the regulation becomes kind of the bludgeon with which to slow or change the pace of, of disruption, uh, often for worse, you know, sometimes for better. But, but uh, in many cases, it, it really becomes the, the, the gating factor, what we refer to in our book as, as the, um, the bullet time. 
matrix, from the matrix where you, you know, you, they can use it to slow down what would otherwise be a much, a much faster disruption. And, and Sean, I know you, you, you and, and CEA have a lot of thoughts about this too because we work very closely together on the, some of these issues. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it is setting up a series of hurdles that inhibit the spread of, uh, of technology. So let's now open the conversation more broadly to uh, Q&A. There, there may or may not be microphones yeah, around. There are. there are two microphones around, so feel free to join our conversation here. Looks like we have oh, <laughs> one comment up here that I see. And uh, that's all why don't you just, <clears throat> and then we've got oh, one okay, they're all conversation on the side, right? back there. <laughs> Thank you, it works. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are talking a great deal about consumer electronics, I understand, given last week and what you do. Is this change going to be driven by consumer toys or by industrial applications like water grids? Like, I'm sorry, what was it? Water grids. Uh -huh. So I think it's both. I mean, I think they're happening at the same time. And again, it's the question of where does the internet make the most sense? So I think we're at this. Uh, period where we're moving into the next phase of the internet. And the example I, I like to give is in 1995, the home page for the internet is something like a Yahoo that is putting additional information on a single page and you go there and, and the metrics we're using to measure success are how long are people staying on that single page. Then with the explosion of websites, we move to something like a search engine like a Google. And then with a further explosion of of internet properties, we start to move to something like a Reddit, which is a curated experience. So I feel like we're now moving, as we go from 2 billion smartphones in the world and 1.7 billion PCs in the world to 50 billion objects, we're moving to the, to the next phase of the internet where we're really def redefining the home page. So what's happening on the interpre enterprise side and on the consumer side are both moving in, the, in that same direction. But the fundamental question is, does the internet make sense in water grids, as your example, or in locomotives, or in engines? And, and so that's the, the enterprise side. And you know, GE calls that the industrial internet. Cisco calls it the internet of everything. Ultimately, and I think in 15 years, we'll just call it the internet. We don't talk about the mobile web very much anymore. It's just the internet. And I think the same thing will happen with the Internet of Things, that in 15 or 20 years, it'll just be the Internet. And I think, I think the both are happening, too. But I think there is really has been a fundamental shift toward consumers taking the lead. Uh, I remember when I first started looking at, at disruptive technology many years ago, you know, the model we always had was it starts in the military applications, mm -hmm. it moves to the in business applications, and then finally to the consumer, particularly for computing because it was so expensive. Now it's clearly the other direction. Um, and that's something that's, that's just spreading. And consumers, you know, because of social media in particular, they can experiment and they can communicate about new stuff much more effectively than enterprises can. And so they do so, and and they become the, the sort of the the, the lab rats uh, for for yeah, th moving the other way. I think just the barriers to I mean everyone has access to the same technologies, but the reality is that the barriers to get something in a consumer's hand and a consumer using it are far lower than getting into an enterprise or indeed you know um, getting into a military application. So I think I think invariably. Um, Consumers or end users, are, you know, are where things hit first, and then, and then, and I think also, you know, you mentioned regulation. Regulation slows down a lot of commercial applications of certain technologies. So, so I think I mean, we're just going to continue to see it consumer-led initially, and. Um, and then used by the enterprise. The water grid example is a good one. I mean, naturally, big infrastructure, it takes a while to deploy technology to lots of enterprise applications. So, um, so you know, I think, I think con consumer leads. And also, you know, the buzz, the brands um, is consumer-led, let's be honest. I think that the, Next the question. Back, way in the back, there's a mic. Good morning. Uh, Larry, this is for you. Um, when we're speaking about like a macro environment with the information and digital, um, what companies or what technologies do we need uh, for a, uh, to be like a conduit uh, of this information and what repositories uh, can we develop off of this and you know, who's going to lead the way in this? 
So I think we have most of the, the core technologies in place, the, the cloud, the high-speed networks. We, we, uh, we, now, you know, we now all talk about 4G, but uh, I was at a conference late last year on 5G uh, networks, uh, which will be coming in the next decade, and they're even crazier than, than the last. Those are sort of the key building blocks, obviously, and then you know, the, the sort of standardized uh, data. Who's going to lead? That's a much more interesting question. Uh, you could sort of you could make the case, I think, economically, that it could be the, the providers. It could be the, the, the network you know, engineers, could be the sort of Ericsson's, or it could be the, the Verizon's, uh, or it could be the information experts, the, the Googles and, and so on. Uh, I think all of those are plausible, and probably some, some combination thereof. And I think what ends up happening in this world of exploding opportunity, exploding data, exploding technological devices and innovation is that we go through these periods of chaos and then we try to organize it and then we have this chaos period and then we go and we try to organize it. And you can see that if you just look simply at the web where Google tried to organize it and then and as, it, as it explodes we start to move to other things that try to curate it and so you have this constant cycle of explosions of information and then curation that tries to, uh, to apply order to that explosion. So I, I think you want to look at whichever companies are trying to create order. And that order, that order might look like aggregation, that order might look like insights and curation, but look at the companies that are trying to apply order to the, the chaos that's unfolding. Yeah, I think it's also, I mean, you talk about it in your book about Metcalfe's law, it's about network effects as well. You know, who's going to, who's going to create the network effect that drives the most value? And, and locks up locks up um, certain ecosystems. Yeah, and I think that's why there's been so much focus on platforms because platform businesses today are trying to create that order to to the chaos. Next question. Um, what new business models do you see emerging? Because just take for example a couple of things that have GE is you know doesn't sell of jet engines anymore, right? They're they're basically renting the rotation of the of the rotors. Or if you take Uber and then the driverless car, you build a whole new industry, right? You don't need a you don't need to own a car anymore. Right? Assets become services. So what what do you see emerging now as new business models that are going to result from that? That's question number one. Question number two is don't, aren't you guys a, f a little bit afraid of what the ultimate solution could be because Kurzweil talked about singularity or if you watch these TV shows you know like person of interest where there's a, a ma master computer that basically directs you to to do certain things and you have Google kind of doing that already aren't you worried that at some juncture we're just you know we, we are not the cog any we're not the director we're just a cog in some big machine you know Sure. Some big thing. Sure. But go back to the first question. What's the real business model? So, <laughs> so I think you I think you uh, hit on a, a piece of it, which is this idea that capital becomes more productive. So one of the things that we've seen over a long period of time is that we replace labor with capital, or we infuse labor with capital. We give our workers PCs, we give them heavy machinery, and the next stage of that is that we give them sensors, and we give them sensor data, and, th and that's one way that will make them more productive. So I look at areas where we have large pools of, of labor and, and areas that are highly labor intensive, and you're already starting to see the infusion of capital into their experiences. So uh, I, I look at like leisure and entertainment, hotels, that have uh, crews that go around and clean the rooms. Today, they'll ring the doorbell, they'll wait, they'll ring the doorbell again, they'll wait, they'll knock, then they'll eventually open the door and inevitably somebody's still in there, so they shut the door and they move on to the next one. You're starting to see hotels use infrared doorbells so that they can just tell that there's somebody in the room and then they become more efficient. You look at Uber, you look at Airbnb, this is taking capital that was being underutilized and deploying it in a more useful, more productive way. So I think anywhere we have capital that's being underutilized or anywhere we have large labor pool that isn't using a lot of capital, 
are areas that will be disrupted in the next 10 years? Or if you have things Well, I like the second question. Um, I know I don't have any any science or any sort of empirical evidence for this, but I've just I've always been very optimistic about the likely impact of, of future technologies. And the way I try to think about it is, you know, there's sort of two there's sort of two possible outcomes. And if you put this in Star Trek terms, you have either you know the United Federation of Planets where everybody cooperates and everybody has sort of the ability to achieve their own uh, personal uh, uh, enlightenment and their own sort of you know personal best, um, or you have the Borg where everybody is nobody, that, that it's just one giant collective. In some ways, these are two very different futures that come from the same set of technologies. Uh, I've, just, I've just always imagined that it would be more like the Federation and less like the board. I'd offer just, I just thought on that, that big, big question. Um, I think you could look at the negative and you know all the fear, but I just think there are so many exciting problems that need solving. We've got half the planet doesn't half the planet, both at a home level and at a you know mobile level, is not connected to the internet. Um, you know, there's diseases. There are so many there are so many big ticket problems to get solved that that will be solved over the next over the next um, few years. That I, I think I think it's hugely exciting and. Uh, and, and the progress that's being made already. So, and I think you know, you mentioned you know the the change in uh, the automotive space. There are so many of these big big items, like the number of people who get. I think you have it in your book. The number of people you know killed on the roads. Things like that being driven down to you know, the idea that our kids will speak to their children and talk about a time when thirty thousand people got killed on the roads. I mean, that's a you know there, there are so many of these really big ticket. Um, items to get solved that technology will help solve. I think it's, uh, I'm really optimistic. And I look at the way we, again, toggle between the physical real world and our digital world. We used to view those as very separate identities, then they started to blend, and today that the mobile phone really is that bridge, and so we're constantly going to the mobile phone. But I think over time, as technology becomes both more pervasive but more seamless with our analog world that it that it becomes less intrusive and I think it'll become a much more natural intuitive experience I look at the way we talk with computers today you go back in time we use things like punch cards things we didn't even understand if you just looked at it but that computers understood and over time we've moved them along this continuum to where it's a much more natural conversation similar to what we might have with another person Last question. Uh, yeah, I have a, a, a point to make. I was at CES last week and saw hundreds and hundreds of great ideas. And what struck me was, you know, what's the ability for to get past the early adopters and the gadget freaks to really make use of these things? 20 years ago, we used to laugh at our parents had a VCR that was blinking 12 o'clock all the time, right? Uh, but today, we have over half the returns in Best Buy and Amazon for electronics. There's no fault found. The product works. Consumer just turned it in again. So we've got a real problem, I think, with going from early adopters to mass market for these consumer products. No matter how sophisticated they are, they can't buy, they don't know what to buy, they don't know how to use them. So how do we get past that adoption curve with a proliferation of all these devices? So I think we're moving into an environment where we have what I refer to as fragmented innovation. We're, we've focused thus far on the products that are widely owned, 80, 90 you know, percent of, of households, but very few products are actually owned by 80 or 90 percent of households. Only 64 percent of households actually own their home. And so uh, I think we're going to start to move into niche markets where the, the saturation is 40, 50 percent, 30 percent. So we'll start to identify these, um, you know, I, th I think the idea is you start with really well-defined, discrete problems and you offer a solution to that and then you start to, over time, pull those together to create this much more holistic experience. So when you look at what's happening with driverless cars, we're getting there by solving these very well-defined, discrete problems. Parallel parking, okay, so you get parallel parking assist. Falling asleep while you're driving, so you get lane assist. Uh, approaching a vehicle while, you've, while you have cruise control engaged, so you have adaptive cruise control. All of a sudden, each one of those starts to look like a very discrete, autonomous experience. You put them all together and you end up with the full 
autonomous driverless car experience. And so I think that's what happens. We start to define these and solve these really well-defined problems that may only be applicable or of interest to 20% of, of individuals, 20% of households. I don't think we're gonna necessarily see mass market adoption of connected yoga mats because not everybody does yoga. Or, you know, we saw propane tanks that were that you could connect to the internet so you could actually know by looking at your smartphone how full they were. And that's probably not applicable to everyone because not everybody uses a gas grill. So we start to move into these smaller niche markets. Yeah, I actually have the opposite response. I, I think what because the cost of experimentation is so low in the market, what you actually see is sort of a thousand experiments, 999 of them fail utterly, but when consumers find the right one, the, somebody who got the, the, the thing right, uh, we, we talked in, in our book about the game Draw Something um, and how it went from you know, zero to millions of users in, in a matter of, of days, for whatever reason they got it right, and what happens now is consumers essentially uh, tell each other. It's not, you know, it's not broadcast marketing like it used to be. It's social media based, uh, they say, all right, this is the one that works. This is the right television, this is the right smartphone, this is the right app, whatever the consumer product is, particularly for electronics is, consumers as a group figure out the winner, and that winner really is, it's very much a winner take all in a lot of these markets, very short winner take all markets, but, but essentially one experiment or a couple of experiments succeed, the rest all fail, the cost wasn't that much in the first place, so the, you know, the investors, whoever they are, are willing to keep, keep that system going. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our three speakers for sharing their insights and ideas so freely. We really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the experience also. As is our fond tradition, we are proud to present you with the Churchill Club Speaker T-shirt. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Please wear that in good health. This program will appear in on our YouTube channel shortly, um, hopefully by tomorrow, I will say, uh, where you can find most of the, our other programs as well. And uh, courtesy of CEA, if you haven't picked up your copy of Sean's book, there should be a copy waiting in the lobby for you. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye.